Racism is real. And it can not only cause psychological pain, but also physiological damage to those who experience it. So today we're gonna look at the science of racism, using studies and evidence to see exactly how it impacts individuals, uncover what makes people racist in the first place, and understand what we can do to successfully combat it right now. All right, so it looks like we have a video on the science of racism today with some well-qualified speakers on the topic. Wait, hold up. This guy looks really familiar. Now, where have I seen him before? Prominent Black Lives Matter activist DeRay McKiss, McKisson yes. accused filmmakers of personally mocking him by dressing up an ape in a blue vest, which he's been known to wear. <laughs> DeRay. You need to go back and watch the 1968 original and check out what the apes were wearing. This has nothing to do with you. Oh, that's right. Well, it looks like we're already off to a great start on a video about the science of racism using a guy who is already known for making false allegations of racism where there is none. Let's continue. Every time a resume comes across somebody's desk, the name on it makes a difference. After sending out over 1,300 fake resumes in response to employment ads, scientists found that resumes with more traditionally sounding black names receive 50% fewer callbacks than those with more white sounding names. Again, these resumes are literally identical except for the names. So there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, they are linking name and race as if discriminating against a name means you are necessarily discriminating due to a person's race. This is merely one factor. Another study by UCLA sociology professor S. Michael Gaddis, which studied how likely people were to perceive a name as black or white, got a little more detailed with its research. In the abstract of the study, Professor Gaddis states, names more commonly given by highly educated black mothers, like Jalen Nia, are less likely to be perceived as black than names given by less educated black mothers like Deshaun and Tanisha. The results suggest that a large body of social science evidence on racial discrimination operates under a misguided assumption that all black names are alike, and the findings from correspondence audits are likely sensitive to name selection. So we know that less educated black mothers are more likely to pick certain names compared to educated black mothers. We also know that black sounding first names are a fairly modern phenomena, as you can see Harvard economics professor Roland Fryer explain in this clip. It was actually in the 50s and the early 60s that we saw huge overlaps in the naming patterns of blacks and whites. So people you know, naming their kids John, Michael, names like that. In 1968 or so, kind of the black power movement actually, you saw distinct bifurcation with Black names getting more distinctively black, and a lot of them were Islamic names, because the black power movement was about identity. Who are we? Who are you? Are you part of us? It wasn't until the late 80s and 90s that we started to get, you know, kind of the made up, concatenated names that you see now. So distinctively black names can tell you about someone's socioeconomic class, and also to some degree where they might have grown up, and the type of neighborhood or family they grew up with. But all that aside, good research should be replicable with similar results. But when people cite the stat about the black name, white name resume study, they are all referring to the same study from 2003 called, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? A Field Experiment on Labor Market Discrimination. Now this study submitted 5,000 resumes across only two cities, Boston and Chicago, across only four occupational categories, sales, administrative support, clerical services, and customer services. But a more recent study from 2016 titled, an updated analysis of race and gender effects on employer interest in job applicants from the University of Missouri submitted 9,000 resumes across seven cities and across six occupational categories, administrative assisting, customer services, information technology, medical assisting, excluding nursing, medical office slash billing and sales. Also, this more recent study included Hispanics as well, instead of just blacks and whites. The difference is instead of using first names to indicate race, which could have the unintended effect of bringing socioeconomic status into the mix as a contributing factor, they used common racially specific surnames for the applicants. The study found no significant difference in response rates across all races. Now, classism is a huge issue. Studies show that if you grow up in poverty, you'll experience more discrimination than people that are wealthier than you. But even when black and white people grow up in wealthy families and have similar education, even though they start wealthy, black boys are more likely to end up poor. Notice how she switched from talking about black people growing up in wealthy families to black boys instead. 
You'll notice important switches in language like this later in the video as well, but let's deal with this case first. Why did she go from saying black people to then mentioning black boys specifically? Well, let's look at the data. According to info collected by the New York Times, it shows that indeed black boys who grew up wealthy end up poorer than their white counterparts. But if this was strictly a race issue, you would expect the same for black girls, right? Well, when you look at this same data set, when it comes to black girls who grew up wealthy, they actually do better than white girls who also grew up wealthy. So to say there is strictly a racial issue at hand here is completely disingenuous and misleading, and there are clearly other confounding factors at play. One of the major factors can start as early as preschool, where teachers are more likely to punish black students over white students for the same behavior. Even in adulthood, prison sentences for the same crime are 10% longer for black men, and the use of force is 3.6 times higher. Okay, where do I even start here? First of all, she is citing three separate observations and or studies, so let's address them one at a time. The first study is called Two Strikes, Race and Disciplining of Young Students. This examines the difference in disciplinary actions between white and black students. The study took 57 female K-12 teachers, average experience 14 years, average class size 26, average age 42 years, 38 white, 2 black, 1 Asian, and 16 unknown from the websites of school districts across the country. According to the study, teachers were shown a picture of a middle school and asked to imagine themselves as a teacher there. They then viewed a school record, adapted from actual office referral records we collected from a public middle school in California, for a student who misbehaved twice. We manipulated student race by using stereotypically black, Darnell or Deshaun, or white, Greg or Jake names. So once again, we have the problem of using names to imply race, much like the first resume job application study. Also, these are teachers who are reading about behavior and not observing it, so these are already second-hand accounts. Now, the study shows that upon first infraction, the accounts of feeling troubled and disciplinary action are virtually identical across both races. But when it comes to second occurrence, they start feeling more troubled and take more disciplinary action towards the black student. The study then goes on to show a chart of actual rates of suspension across the country based on race, which shows blacks are disproportionately disciplined compared to whites. Of course, the chart also shows that Asians are disproportionately punished least of all, but I guess we'll just ignore that. Now, nowhere in this study does it actually show any metric we can use to determine if the actual number of suspensions is justified or reflected in any other data sets. Well, that's where I come in. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, which is part of the United States Department of Education, across K-12 schools where 95% or more of the school is white, there was a violent incident rate of 14.2 per 1,000 students. But in schools where 50% or less were white, the violent incident rate was 21.2 per 1,000 students. That means more diverse schools had a violence incident rate 50% higher than the less diverse schools. This 50% figure is greater than any difference shown in the study. The second study reference is one that deals with sentencing disparities between whites and blacks and uses this as evidence of racism. Now, it's incredibly difficult to account for all mitigating factors, but this study did the best it could, and unlike many other studies which only looked at sentencing, this study from Sonia Starr started from the time of arrest and, like the video says, still found a 10% disparity between black males and white males when they controlled for as many factors as they could. Also, keep in mind that this study only looked at federal cases specifically and not state cases. But is this strictly a racial issue? Well, if we look at another study by the same author, we can see that she also did an analysis on the gender disparity and she found not a 10% sentencing difference for the same crimes, but a 63% sentencing length difference between the genders when all relevant factors were accounted for. This study finds dramatic unexplained gender gaps in federal criminal cases, conditional on arrest offense, criminal history, and other pre-charge observables, men receive 63% longer sentences on average than women do. Women are also significantly likelier to avoid charges and convictions, and twice as likely to avoid incarceration if convicted. Now this third stat comes from a study called The Science of Justice, Race, Arrest, and Police Use of Force. Now in this study, they aren't controlling for any factors and are merely looking for total use of force cases. That's it. Also, it's not really a total, it's a total across 12 different police departments, and they also don't know the reasons listed as to why the force was used. In fact, the researchers said so in their study, noting that, 
It is important to be cautious about overgeneralizing these results. Because of the relatively small number of departments and because we do not know very much about what residents did during the interactions that turned forceful. Just because one race is receiving 3.6 times more use of force than another does not automatically mean there is racism afoot. For example, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which falls under the control of the United States Department of Justice, between 1980 and 2008, blacks were disproportionately represented as both homicide victims and offenders. The victimization rate for blacks, 27.8 per 100,000, was six times higher than the rate for whites, 4.5 per 100,000. The offending rate for blacks, 34.4 per 100,000, was almost eight times higher than the rate for whites, 4.5 per 100,000. So a 3.6 times higher rate for use of force against blacks is not out of line when it comes to the disparity in violence that blacks commit versus whites. When studying the existence of racism towards indigenous people in Australia, 45% of indigenous families reported racism. And interestingly, scientists began to link these experiences to poor mental health status, sleep difficulties, obesity, and even asthma. Notice again the difference in language. The graphic on the screen says experienced, but the speaker said reported. There is a difference there. It's likely that they meant to say reported experiencing racism, but these are subjective feelings and not objective. Now, as for the medical claims, we'll address that a bit later in the video. Now, racism involves a set of people holding power over other people. Wrong. Yeah. No, the definition of racism has nothing to do with power. Racism is a belief, while power is a capacity. If we look at the dictionary definition of racism, there is no mention of power anywhere. This definition that DeRay is using where racism requires power is used by many in social justice circles to deny that blacks or other minorities can be racist because they argue that those groups do not hold institutional or systemic power. And that imbalance in power is what causes stress. And again, this can be measured experimentally. When Latina students were paired with people they've been told had racial bias against them, their cardiovascular stress response went up compared to those who are partner with people they told had no bias against them at all. The key word here is told. They weren't actually experiencing racism, but rather they were primed by the researchers to believe that someone was prejudiced or racist against them, and this resulted in their cardiovascular stress response increasing. This is the perfect example for why it is so detrimental to tell people of color that they are constantly victims of racism or that people who are not like them will likely have racist thoughts towards them. This isn't a study that proves racism hurts people. It's a study that shows how perceiving that others are racist towards you, even though they aren't, will hurt you. Again, the researchers in this study didn't change anything about the students they paired the Latina students with. They merely told the Latina students that the people they were interacting with held prejudicial views against them. So the lesson here is to not tell people they are experiencing racism when they aren't experiencing racism. Of course you'd expect that if you go to your doctor, your health would be in good hands. But racial biases exist here as well. Hundreds of medical physicians were asked to look over a case of either black or white patients who likely just suffered a heart attack. Those who scored higher on a racial bias test were less likely to prescribe black patients a drug that would reduce blood clots and prevent heart attacks. So the research they are citing comes from a 2006 study called Implicit Bias Among Physicians and Its Prediction of Thrombolysis Decisions for Black and White Patients. Now in this study, they used the IAT, or Implicit Association Test, also known as Implicit Bias or Unconscious Bias Test, to determine racial bias in the study. Now I won't go too much into detail about all the problems with implicit bias tests, but in short, they have been found to be both unreliable and invalid due to having test-retest reliability scores of 0.44 and according to Edward Matry, Distinguished Professor and Director of Center of Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh, for other aspects of psychology, if you have a test that's not replicated at 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you just don't use it. Not to mention there were four separate meta-analyses undertaken between 2009 and 2015, each examining between 46 and 167 individual studies all showed the IAT to be a weak predictor of behavior. But let's get to the actual study. First of all, in the video, they said hundreds of doctors. The study involved a sample of 220 doctors, which I guess you could call hundreds, but I'm just nitpicking. As you can see, the study involved a sample of 131 white doctors, 10 black, 5 Hispanic, 51 Asian, and 12 other. 
Now, in the video, they said doctors with higher implicit bias were less likely to treat patients with the drug to reduce blood clots. Now, if we go down to the actual graphs, this is what we see. We have four different graphs, A, B, C, and D. They each measure a different aspect of the implicit bias test, while D, the final graphic, is a composite of the various aspects. On the vertical y-axis, we can see treatment with thromboliasis. And on the horizontal x-axis, we can see the degree of implicit bias from low to high. Also, there are two lines. The dotted line with solid squares at the end represents black patients, and the solid line with triangles at the end represents white patients. Now, if we ignore the line for white patients, it does seem that as implicit bias increases, that treatment levels for black patients decrease. But that ignores the actual data, which must be taken into context with white patients. As you can see, the biggest disparity between white and black patients is when implicit bias is low. The most equal treatment between white and black patients is when implicit bias is high. Also note that treatment for white patients is much lower at low implicit bias levels than it is for black patients at high implicit bias levels. So this study either shows that doctors are more racist against whites at low implicit bias levels than they are against blacks at high implicit bias levels, or that doctors at low implicit bias levels are overprescribing to blacks and that doctors at high implicit bias levels are treating patients more equally. You decide based on the data. In fact, half of white medical students and residents still believe in false biological differences between white and black patients. Like that black patients are more pain tolerant than white patients because of less sensitive nerve endings and thicker skin. These false beliefs negatively contribute to medical treatment. So he calls these false beliefs, but he does not offer any studies in the video. We already know that biological differences between races exist when it comes to skin color, average height, prevalence of certain types of cancers, lactose intolerance, etc. And even when it comes to pain tolerance, there seems to be scientific studies indicating that as well. So are the medical students he's citing racist? Or are they just reading scientific literature? This might seem a little obvious, but people who spend more time with different races and different backgrounds show less bias. This is called contact theory, where intergroup contact reduces intergroup prejudice. It's why something like segregation increases racist behaviors and ideas. The presenter here makes the obvious mistake of conflating correlation with causation. It could be just as true that people who have less prejudice and are less racist to begin with would associate with people of other races, while people who are more prejudicial and racist would choose to disassociate and live separately from those of other races. And this notion of contact theory has some flaws. Contact theory is the notion that the more people are exposed and have more contact with a member of another group, that they will have more trust and less fear of that group. Conversely, conflict theory is the notion that diversity fosters outgroup distrust and in-group solidarity. One of the most well-known studies on this topic is E Pluribus Unum, Diversity and Community in the 21st Century, the 2006 Johann Skitt Prize Lecture by Robert D. Putnam. In this study, they wanted to measure social capital, which means the networks of relationships among people who live and work in a particular society, enabling that society to function effectively. The way they did this is by taking samples from various cities, counties, regions, states, and even the nation at large until they had almost 30,000 respondents. They acquired demographical information for these various regions and then asked respondents about their level of trust for people of different races, their own race, and their neighbors. As you can see in the first graph, there is a positive correlation between ethnic homogeneity and trust of other races, meaning the less racially diverse your community is, the more you trust other races. Places like my hometown of San Francisco, placed at the very bottom of the list, where it is among the most racially diverse cities, but has the lowest level of trust for people of other races. This is in contrast to an area like rural South Dakota, where there is very little racial diversity, but people's level of trust for other races is the highest. The graphs for trusting one's neighbor and trust of one's own race are also virtually identical to the previous graph, so I won't focus on those too much, but these graphs completely go against the idea of contact theory and fall almost completely in line with conflict theory. Now, before you start thinking that diversity is bad and leads to all these problems, the final graph here shows that when you measure ethnocentric trust, which is the measure of trust of one's own race minus the trust of others, you actually have no correlation at all. So the issue is much more complicated, and this is just one metric of diversity and trust. Other benefits like economic benefits or crime or quality of life are definitely something to take into account, but those are topics for another time.
Either way, the contact theory hypothesis posed in this video is by no means conclusive and in fact much research points in the opposite direction. The most important thing is to be aware. Aware that racism exists. Aware that it is damaging. And aware that it is up to you to combat it altogether. I agree. It's important to be aware and scientifically minded and evidence based, especially when it comes to racism. That's why I made this video to offer evidence and science so that viewers could have a better understanding and not a one sided propaganda video. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. Please share it if you enjoyed it. And if you would like to support the work done on this channel, please consider lending your support on Patreon, where you can gain access to exclusive video clips, our patron only discord server and other perks. So please go to www.patreon.com slash nuance bro to become a supporter today. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time, bro.